We've been going through Luke Acts here at the church. Uh, we'll keep going through Luke Acts until there's no more Luke Acts to go through, which I think is about seven more weeks, uh, give or take. So we're in chapter 23 today. Just as a quick reminder from last week, remember, uh, we've been building up to Paul going back to Jerusalem uh, with lots of people telling Paul, don't go back to Jerusalem. If you go back to Jerusalem, they're going to hurt you. They may even kill you. And Paul going, I got to go back to Jerusalem. And so last week he gets back to Jerusalem. Uh, the crowd riots because they're so mad at him because he has taken Christianity into the world. He has said Christ is the Messiah. He has said that Judaism is not just for the Jews, but it's for Gentiles too, which has irritated the Jews to the point that they're like rioting in the city and trying to beat him up. Last week then we dealt with the Roman guard had grabbed him to get him into a place and get him safe. And before they could go there, Paul said, let me talk to the crowd, which is very Pauline uh, in that like, hey, they're trying to kill you. Oh, good. This is the time to start preaching. So Paul starts preaching, walks through like what happened. They get angry with him. And so we talked about last week that Paul's conviction for his faith was not uh, philosophical. It was not like he was a con man or a grifter, but Jesus died and resurrected from the dead. That was truth and fact in his life, and he was willing to die so that people knew the truth of that. So we talked about that last week. If that sounds interesting to you, you can hear that message online. You can look us up on Facebook at Vintage Church in Decatur. Uh, we post messages there. We also have the, all the messages are posted on YouTube to begin with. So if you search Pastor Pat Edrington, you can pull up uh, a whole myriad of things and check that out uh, and catch up if you've missed a week. And then this week, we're going to talk about um, a story that, as I was talking with people, and uh, that most people probably don't know, or if you know, you vaguely know about it, but uh, there's this part in verse 2 in chapter 23 where it says, and hit him in the mouth. Um, and so this week has got me thinking a lot about various fights and stupid things I've seen um, over the years between youth ministry and just being around men. If you didn't know, men tend to fight and, um, in college. We did this thing called Holer Fest. Uh, I wasn't a part of Holer Fest because I did not live in the hole. Now, they called the hole, Timothy Hall was called the hole because it was the oldest dorm, and that was where all the cool kids lived. Um, and so we did not live there, but we were the ringer boys off of F1, um, and they would do um, backyard fights because that was popular in the 90s. Um, back before we uh, everybody was afraid to hurt themselves and you got a participation trophy. We had where we would like hang out and eat um, smoked meat and beat each other up, and that was a Friday evening. So they would do backyard fights, which meant you put on um, boxing gloves and you beat the brakes off your various roommates and people that you went to Bible college with. And so they had this event, and this kid won, and he was very proud of the fact that he was a Bible college student and he had won the backyard fights event until my roommate got home, and my roommate at the time was a bona fide psychotic, um, and so we were, he was taking a shower and we were all hanging out don't ask it's bible college and he goes what'd you guys do tonight and i said we had backyard fights and dave bumbles beat everybody up now dave bumbles was a big kid about six four great big football player looking kid who had blown his knee out um, playing football and had come to bible college because that was the end of his i'm going to be famous playing football he, it's what he's planned on doing anyway once he got through and so he was there and so my roommate goes i can beat him up and I go, well, nobody asked you that. And you're like 5'9". And you walk weird. Uh, you're pigeon-toed. And he's an enormous man. And there's a reason why there's weight classes in fighting. And if he gets his hands on you, you will die. And he goes, I can take him anytime, anywhere. I'm not afraid of him. So I did what any loving roommate should do in that situation. I said, hold on a minute. And I walked over to the, to the hole. And I said, is Dave around? And they said, yeah, he's down the hall. And I said, hey. My roommate, uh, he wants around with you for the backyard fights because, and I quote, he says he can take you, he's not afraid of you, and he thinks you're a big weenie. <laughs> so this kid stood up and he goes, where's he at? And I go, he's taking a shower, he'll be out in a second. So I go, all right, he's out there. So he goes, all right, well, give me a minute. So my buddy goes to his room, he puts on a pair of athletic shorts, and that's it. And I'm like, oh, great, so you're going to fight him in the nude, cool. So... Uh, he goes out in the backyard out behind the guy's dorm, and Dave's standing there with his crowd of men like boys do, and they're laughing and making fun of this pigeon-toed kid as he walks out. And Justin looks at me, and he goes, that's the guy? And I go, yeah, he won. He goes, yeah, no problem. I got this. And Dave's like, I can hear you. And he's like, yeah, I'm not afraid of you. He goes, what are the rules? Which is always hilarious, right, when you think about fighting. Like, what's, what's your rules for the – so Dave goes, well, 
you can't hit me in the face. Justin goes, no, where's your face at? And Dave goes, well, my face, from like here to here. And he goes, okay, no face shot, got it. And he goes, any other rules? And he goes, well, I don't, don't hit me in the crotch, okay? No crotch shots, got it. And I go, okay, so are we going to do, do this? Justin goes, yeah, I mean, if, if he wants to subject himself to this, but I'm going to beat this guy up, and he's going to look dumb in front of his friends. And I'm like, you are going to get, I'm like, this is like, the, it's like that moment, you know how every person, you either like, when you see a train wreck, you feel terrible for everybody involved, or you're like, can't take your eyes away, and you're like, I wish somebody would have scheduled this, because I would have brought popcorn. That's how I feel about training. And I'm like, this is going to be a train, it's going to be, I'm like, well, obviously, Dave, you don't know what you're doing, and this guy's nuts, so he's going to take you. And so Dave, Dave steps back to fight. Before we ever say go, Dave, he rears up like this, and Justin hit that dude as hard as he could right in the throat. Yeah, O is right. Have you ever heard somebody get hit in the throat? It's terrifying. Your body makes noises that don't seem like you should be making. And I'm like, you killed him. He's going to die. Dave falls on the ground. He, he, he. I'm like, he's dead. And Justin goes, I told you I was going to win. And I go, you're insane. You just killed somebody. And he's like, he ain't going to die. I didn't hit him that hard. And I'm like, you hit him in the throat. Who hits people in the throat? And he goes, it's backyard fights. There's no rules. And I'm like, you can't just haul off and hit somebody in the throat. So I'm like, he goes, nope, that's not the rules. The rule said I couldn't hit him in the face. I asked him specifically, where is your face? He said, your face is from here to here. This is not your face. <sighs> All right, well, you win, I guess. Yes, I go. Uh, great. Now, no one's ever going to talk to us, and you're the weird kid, but cool. You, you did it. So that was my, that's an experience, though, when you think about fighting. Fighting is always stupid. It's always like this weird you never know, like, this is not how civilized, normal people behave, right? Like, you don't go into Walmart, and if the lady in front of you in that stupid cart, because why do they have those carts? There should be cart time that you get to ride the car. When she's driving two miles an hour in front of you, you don't, like, get so frustrated you walk up and, like, belt her in the head. That's not how civilized people behave. And yet when we read this story today, that seems to be, like, normal behavior. Verse 20, or chapter 23, verse 1 says, Looking intently... At the council, Paul says, Brother, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. That's all he says. Brothers, I've lived my life before God in good conscience. Meaning, everything I've ever done has been good. Not saying I've never sinned. Not saying I'm perfect. What he's saying is when it comes to the ministry that I've done, the things I've done in the name of Jesus, the things I've done to advance the gospel, I have good conscience about them. I don't think those things are Wrong. Now remember, he's already started one riot with this talk, so this probably isn't going to go over well. And then you have the weirdest fight ever. The high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him, strike him in the mouth. Ananias doesn't hit him. He's like, hey, hit him in the face. And then Paul goes, well, God's going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. What an insult. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by Paul said, why would you revile God's high priest? Paul said, I did not know, brothers, he was the high priest. For it's written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler or of your people. So what's going on? Let's break this down because it feels a little weird and a little strange. So Ananias, just as a quick history lesson, this is not Ananias that is Ananias that people get confused when we talk about Jesus and Ananias and Caiaphas. Ananias is the old high priest who's like the high priest in the background, like the evil emperor in Star Wars, and Caiaphas is like the Banana Republic high priest who does whatever Ananias, and they're like the mafia, in the, and they're corrupt and evil. This is a new corrupt and evil guy. Uh, this guy's name is Ananias. He's a new new high priest. Uh, he loved the Romans, uh, so he was constantly like curtailing to the Romans. And if you get into Josephus' history, uh, Josephus says he was the most corrupt high priest they ever had, uh, and he was executed by the Jewish uh, Sanhedrin, and good is Josephus' take on that. He was executed because he was stealing um, tithe money that people were giving to the church in Jerusalem that was so poor Paul is going around to Gentile churches to bring money back to them because they don't have anything. Well, they don't have anything because this cat is stealing all the money from them. So then he is the guy, when Paul says, everything I've done up until this point, I, I, 
I am of good conscience. This is what God wanted me to do. That makes him so angry. He says, hey, you guys around him, hit him in the face. Cork that dude. And they do. And Paul's response is not an insult you hear today. God's going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. You don't hear that a lot when kids get mad. Dad, Lena called me a wall. Where's that come from? That comes out of Ezekiel 13, 3 through 10. Here's what that says. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Your prophets have been like jackals among ruins, O Israel. You've not gone up into the breaches or built up a wall for the house of Israel that it might stand in the battle on the day of the Lord. They've seen false visions and lying divinations. They say, declares the Lord when the Lord has not sent them. And yet they expect him to fulfill their words. Have you not seen a false vision and uttered a lying divination? Wherever you have said, declares the Lord, although I have not spoken, therefore thus says the Lord. Because you have uttered falsehoods and seen lying visions, behold, I am against you, declares the Lord God. My hand will be against the prophets who have seen false visions and have given lying divinations. They shall not be in the council of my people, nor be enrolled in the register of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Precisely because they have misled my people, saying, peace when there is no peace, and because... When the people build a wall, these prophets smear it with whitewash. So, Paul's making friends, right? This insult goes from that doesn't make any sense to like, oh, wow, he, he really uh, put his foot in it there. He's like, hey, you, you are so corrupt and evil that God doesn't even recognize you and he judges you. You're whitewashed. Jesus does the same thing. He calls the religious uh, leaders at the time whitewashed tombs. Because when they would have Passover, it was against Jewish custom and Jewish law for you to touch anything that housed the dead. And so when you were coming into the cities, they would paint the tombs white so that if you were a foreigner, you wouldn't accidentally wander into a cemetery and then couldn't participate in Passover because you were ceremonially unclean for seven days. So it could be referencing that, or it could be referencing Ezekiel. Either way, this is not the way you make friends with people who want to kill you. And then... What happens? Well, they respond to him and go, you can't do that. And he's like, well, you can't hit me in the mouth. That's against the law. And they're like, well, you're making fun of the high priest. That's just as against the law. And what did Paul say? Well, I didn't know he was the high priest. And then if you are a Bible dork, there's like commentary after commentary arguing about what's going on with Paul because it's it's so funny. Listen, the easiest answer here is Paul just doesn't know he's the high priest, right? He's been gone for Jerusalem for 20 years. They could have just had a switch in power. There's nothing to say that these guys are in their like ceremonial robes to connotate he is the high priest. So it could have just been like, this guy said to hit me, and so I said what I said to him because he's the guy who said it. That makes the most sense to me. Some people think he's being sarcastic, which is more fun, but hard to do. Right? Like Paul's like, well, I didn't know he was the high priest. I mean, I would have never said something against a high priest that way because a high priest would never have me hit in the mouth because a high priest would know the law. Or it also could be that Paul can't see. Remember in Galatians when we talked about how, look at my big letters that I'm using? It could be he's just blind. And he just got popped in the face, right? Can't see. Whoever did that, you're a whitewashed wall. Whatever goes on, though, Paul recognizes that he has done something he shouldn't have done by responding the way he did because this guy is in authority and God puts into power who he wants in power. Now here's what's not going to happen today. We're not going to have a long message about voting and Republicans and Democrats, even though when you start to watch other people preach that, that's the way they go with this because uh, that does not fit context here. But I will say... There is something for Christians to take away from this, that if Paul is the example for how we should live, Paul has respect for this guy, even though this guy is corrupt. And as Christians, we should be the same. Because remember, the battle is not against flesh and blood. The battle is against the evil and the principalities of this world. And if you believe God is on the throne, 
and you believe God's kingdom is not of this world, and you believe our time here is not permanent, and we're just passing through, and we're headed for glory, and we're going to uh, forsake all and follow after Him, then we should probably should not like freak out over whoever's in political power. Because, you know, God's still on the throne, and He still conquered death, hell, and the grave, so you could find redemption for your sins. There's, there's bigger things to worry about than which um, person we voted on. All that to be said, though, let's move on because I don't want to talk about politics. So then, after that, where does it go? Paul is left then with, here we are, stuck in this place that you are accusing me of something, I've messed up, and we start to get insight into maybe what Paul is going through, especially when we put it into the context of the other epistles. If you don't know, uh, when God calls you into ministry, he equips you usually to reach certain people. You just feel like, this is my home crowd. This is the group I, that God has called me to convey the gospel to. That's why it's so important that each of us find our place in the body of Christ, because we need each and every person to have that group of people so that we reach the most people we can possibly reach. You don't just like come across somebody and go, oh, I, I like Pastor Pat's when he preaches, so I follow him, and that's the ministry. No, like we're all of the same mind, same thought process, and we collectively are trying to reach the same people. Well, Paul's people are the Jews. It's important you know when we talk about Paul, Paul did not want to go to war with Judaism. Paul didn't, Jesus didn't want to go to war with Judaism. There's never this idea that they're like, we hate Jewish people and we hate Judaism and we're anti-Semitic and we, you know, they're responsible for this and we're going to... No, they wanted to reconcile Judaism. Christ is the Jewish Messiah. Paul goes as far to write this in Romans 9. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them they belong, and to them belongs the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belongs the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed and forever. Amen. If you missed it, Paul said, I wish that I could uh, cut myself off and be accursed from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Paul is saying, I would condemn myself to hell so that the Jewish people may know that Jesus is the Messiah. Listen, I love you. I don't go that far. Like, I want you to know Christ, and I want you to figure it out, and I'm going to preach hard, talk hard, and try to lead you in a way that you can discover it, and I want you to grow in your faith. But if Jesus comes to me and goes, hey, well, you want to go to hell for all them? Nope. Mm-mm. I mean, I tried, God. I really did. That is serious conviction that Paul is feeling that Paul wants. It could lay into why Paul was so adamant he was going back to Jerusalem with people saying, if you go, you're going to get run over. Don't go back there. They're going to run you over. Listen, when God calls you and you have that ministry mind and you feel like that's the people I'm supposed to reach, that wakes you up at night. That's a burden you bear. That's this thing you can't get past to the place you'll put yourself in harm's way because you feel like this is what God wants you to do. And we have this recorded then in Acts. Here's Paul. He's finally in front of the people who have the power and authority to be an influence inside of Judaism. He gets this moment to speak, this moment to do what he's supposed to do to talk. And he goes to say something and they punch him in the head. They don't listen. Paul tries again. Verse 6, When Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council. Now, real quick, before we talk about what he says, let's have uh, Pharisees, Sadducees 101. Pharisees were the larger group. There was more of them than there were Sadducees. Pharisees believe in all of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in the eyes of Judaism, not so much in the eyes of Christians. So they believe in the, the Torah, which is the first five books of the Old Testament. Then they believe in what they call the Talmud and the Mishnah. That's the rest of the Old Testament. And then that is also the rabbinical interpretation of how we're supposed to handle these laws. Do you know, inside of Judaism and the Mishnah, there is the idea that if you are making soup in a public square, this is how intense the Mishnah is. Right? So you're good Jews, you're having a big street party, and we're making kosher soup. If a, if a Gentile, an evil, dirty Gentile, were to sneak in and put ham 
in your soup, what do you do? Because you can't eat ham. Ham's unclean. If you didn't know, Jewish people can't have ham or bacon. Wow, that is harsh. The rabbis got together and decided how much ham could go into the soup before you had to throw the soup out. If the soup is more than 1 60th percent ham, you can't eat it. But if it's less than, you're good. And the Pharisees would have said, we support that, that's divinely inspired, and nobody can take anything away from that, that's what we believe in. They believe in all of that. They believe in death and resurrection. They believe in afterlife. They believe in demons. They believe in angels. They, they are the big group. And they usually had all of the power in the synagogues, which is why when you see Jesus or Paul wandering around and they're dealing with people, they're probably dealing with Pharisees, not so much Sadducees. Now, Sadducees, they controlled the Sanhedrin, which was like the Jewish high council in Jerusalem, and they controlled the temple. So the high priest, the chief priest, always a Sadducee. The Sadducees, um, they have weird beliefs. So they only believe in the Torah, only the first five books. All the rest of it doesn't count. Don't believe in any of that. They don't believe in death or resurrection or afterlife. All they believe is you die and that's it. So there's no, like, any hope past the moment. They don't believe God interacts with creation. Uh, and so they believe then that the law is God. So they were fierce about we're going to keep the law, we're going to know the law, we're going to memorize the law, the law, the law, the law. They love the Romans. Because the Romans validated them as power and not the Pharisees, basically because the Pharisees were going around saying we need to um, kill the Romans and get them out of here um, because there's a promise of a Messiah. The Sadducees were like, no, the Romans are our friends. That's not anywhere in the Bible that we believe in. We only believe in the Torah. Don't kill them. They also were very prone to Hellenization. If you don't know what Hellenization is, that means making things Greek. So they liked to make things Greek. They would add Greek things into stuff like various gods and the way things looked and the way things are. Now, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, then, uh, they don't get along. Because if you have one side that says, we believe in the uh, resurrection of the dead, and we believe in the afterlife, and we believe God is imminently involved in creation, uh, and the other side says, no, it's not, you can see why that may create problems when you have your barbecue, right? Like, the, we don't talk about it because we can't agree, right? No religions, no politics, no, are you a Pharisee or I'm a Sadducee? That was the rule of the day. Paul then, when he starts to speak, knows all of that, and you're going to see how brilliant he is with what he says. Paul says this in verse, picking up here, verse 6, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. So now Paul says, look, what, what he's doing here is you're not putting me on trial, you're putting your own trial, your beliefs. What you believe now is going to be on trial. So I believe in the resurrection of the dead and I'm a Pharisee. Well, when he said that, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the assembly was divided. Again, there's more Pharisees. So Paul also knows in this room, more people in the crowd are going to be with me if I say this thing that I say. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Well, then a great clamor arose. If you don't know the word clamor, clamor is also the word they use for riot. Some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? Listen, we'll take him in, even if the weird Son of God stuff and all that, because it's given an opportunity for us to argue why our beliefs are right and your beliefs are wrong. Ha-ha! Take that, Sadducees! Let's have a riot. And the dissension became violent. The tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn into pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. Now remember, they want to put Paul on trial and they want to murder Paul and kill him because Paul, everywhere he goes, starts riots. So then Paul says this thing to them and what do they do? Start a riot. Well, that's okay because it's, it's different for reasons. But if you're Paul, where does your brain go in the midst of all of this? I failed, right? 
Like I wanted this thing. I tried to do this thing. I wanted them to know who Jesus was. I wanted to preach this right. I wanted this thing to be a revival. I wanted the Jews to come back to the heart of the Father to see the Son come who lived, breathed, died, and resurrected for the forgiveness of sins. There's hope found in Him. And all I've done is get punched in the mouth, irritated people, and caused another riot. I am not good at this. How would he not feel that way? How would you not feel like I've fallen short? And for all of us this morning, that's faith sometimes, right? I've had people ask me the question. I know what I'm supposed to be doing, but I can't stop doing this thing even though I know I'm not supposed to do it. What should I do? Well, then you're in a fist fight. I think sometimes as Christians we forget you're in a fist fight. And sometimes life knocks you in the mouth. Like fist fights aren't clean. They're not like uplifting. They're not like like you don't take time out. You don't go time out, time out, break, everybody get water. Everybody get water. We're having a fist fight out here. Whoo, what a rough day. They're nuts. used to tell people all the time, you want to win in a fist fight? You know how you want a fist fight? If you didn't know, I'm going to teach you. Be the craziest one. That's who wins a fist fight. It's not the most trained. It's not the most understanding. It's the, who's the guy that's willing to be the, the most nuts? What'd Justin do? He punched a dude in the throat. He didn't care if he went to jail. He didn't care if he killed the guy. He didn't care if he crushed his windpipe. He just wanted to win. In the throat. If you want to win... You've got to go to the extreme, and then you've got to be willing to deal with the consequences of it. Which means then, that's not an easy thing to do. Right? Like, because if, listen, the vast majority of us are not insane. That's not how people think. So whenever we say to you, hey, God's called you out of darkness and into light. He wants you to live a certain way and behave a certain way. And you go, yeah, that's true, and I'm trying to get there, but I keep struggling with this, and I keep doing with that. You, it's, your mindset is not, I need to deal with this with that way. The mindset is, I can't deal with it that way, and it keeps knocking me down. It keeps beating me up. I keep failing. I keep feeling like I'm not good enough, and I don't measure up. I feel like God's not going to love me. He's not going to accept me because I can't be this thing he thinks I'm supposed to be. And what you've done is you've transitioned from Christ making you holy to you making your holy so Christ will love you, and that's not Christianity. Of course you're going to fail. Of course you're going to get beat up. Of course you're going to lose. I can tell you all day long how to accomplish what you're supposed to accomplish, but you need to recognize that in the middle of a fight, sometimes you might lose. And that's okay. It's not about if you got knocked down. It's about did you get back up? Did you keep fighting the fight? See, Paul could have taken this moment, and it could have been it for him, right? He could have gone back to his jail cell. He could have sat down on the floor. He could have said, I'll preach no more forever. Jesus, I tried. They won't listen to me. They can't hear me. They won't change. I'll just be content to be uncomfortable and sad. The enemy of this world in the fight wants you to give up. That's why you, that's how fights work. You won't do what I want you to do, so I'm going to punch you in the face until you do it. I don't want to be a sinner. I don't want to keep doing this thing I want to do. I want to be this thing. And the enemy hears it and goes, well, I'm going to punch you in the head until you do the thing I want you to do. That's how violence works. I'm going to keep beating you up until you be the thing I want you to be. But what we have to do is say, you can't beat this thing out of me. I am who I am. I'll never give it up. I'll never walk away from it. And you know what separates us from the world and what's different? Well, it's how these verses end today. Now, this is one of those verses in Acts. Nobody talks about it, and it is crazy to think about that nobody knows this took place. Here's what happens. Uh, verse 11, the following night, the Lord stood by him. Huh? 
How come nobody knows that after all this goes on, Jesus is just nonchalantly hanging out in Paul's prison cell? The following night, the Lord stu- what? The Lord stood by Paul after he had failed miserably. He calls the high priest a white wall, whitewash wall. He sins. He causes a riot again. They chase him out. He's got to be rescued by a bunch of Gentile soldiers who are like, "What is going on?" And then a couple days later, Paul's sitting in his, his cell, and what Jesus just shows up. Like, how come nobody talks about this? We're not going to preach it, or like, you know, like Paul just doesn't have one experience with Jesus. There's just this random moment that he's like, in a, uh, "Hey, hey, Jesus, what are you doing here?" I was around, thought I'd check in with you. And what's he say? Take courage. Take courage, for as you have testified to the fact about me in Jerusalem, well, you need to do that in Rome too. Take courage. You got this. They're punching me in the mouth. Yeah, it probably hurt. Get out there and take another one. Listen, you did great with these guys. They're dead tombs. I told them the same thing. Remember? I said, you're all a bunch of whitewashed tombs, dead on the inside, pretty on the out, trying to pretend like you're something you're not. I did that too. Take courage, Paul. Take courage, Christian. You're not losing a fight. Jesus already won it. You're not falling short. You're not failing. You're not making, you're not less than. You're not making God angry. You're not living up to the calling He's placed over you. Is the cross not big enough to conquer the sin that's beating you up? Have you forgotten who He is and what He did and what He accomplished? Do you not know you're free from death, hell, and the grave? Do you know you're not bound to your past? Do you know you're not the thing that you did? That even though the enemy keeps throwing that back in your face, Jesus has already destroyed it, not just punched it in the mouth, crucified it, put it to death. It's gone. Death, hell, and the grave conquered by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're made whole and made complete. In Revelation, it talks about this thing called the, the white throne judgment. And as a kid, they'd use it to scare the garbage out of you about all the little creepy things you were doing because they're like, one of these days, they're going to walk you out there in front of everybody and read about how much of a weirdo you are and they're all going to see what you did. And then you actually read it and you're like, that's not what this says, but thank you for ruining my junior high years. What it says is, at the white throne judgment, you'll be judged on the merits of what it is that you believe and what you did. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means uh, they're going to look at you and go, did you believe in Jesus or not? If not, we're going to get into all your mess. But if so, we're going to get into Jesus' mess. Because he's conquered the things that you did. So take courage. He's overcome the world. Take courage, Paul. Just nonchalant Jesus hanging out. Do you know that when the world gets beat up, when the world gets overcome, when you have things happening in this world that you think you can't get past, there's no avenue for them to, but as believers and children of the King, we get to crawl back to our houses and sit down with a Lord that still comes and communes with His people in the same way He communicated with Paul here. This is some special occasion. This is how God lives and breathes and works because He died and resurrected. He is alive and breathing and working in a church. And if you feel like you're overwhelmed, and if you feel like you're losing in a fist fight, all you got to do is call out to the God who loves you and created you and died for you and He will stand by your side as long as it takes telling you to take courage and hold on son, hold on daughter. I have this. My boy came up to me this week and he goes, how tall are you? And I said, I'm 6'2". Do you weigh over 300 pounds? Yes, I do. And he said, I knew you could beat him up. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, we were arguing at school over whose dad could beat up who. And his dad is way smaller than you. They said, there's no way he weighs over 300 pounds. Nobody weighs over that. And I said, you need to go to Walmart, son. But listen, there is something we can pull from that in this. Jay loves his dad in the place of no matter what I face or what I go to, my dad's got this. He's not smart enough to know that's not true. He just believes it. 
He just believes with the faith of a child that no matter if, if my dad can take anybody because he's big. Why don't we believe that as Christians? Why do we stand and struggle in sin issues and stand and struggle and feel like we're not good enough, we don't measure up, when we have a dad who conquered death, who conquered hell, who conquered the grave? Why do we go, well, I can't, I can't stop this thing or I can't stop that thing? Have you forgotten who Jesus is? Take courage, kid. Take courage, Paul. You tried in Jerusalem. These guys don't get it and they never will. They're just dead religious people. But I'm going to send you to Rome where you wanted to go. The whole book of Acts. I'm going to send you to Rome, which is 2,000 miles away. It's an eight-hour plane trip from Jerusalem to Rome. Paul's walking. Ain't no planes in that time. That's a miracle in itself. What else does this say to Paul? He's not going to die in Jerusalem. Hey, you may feel like your life's at an end. You may feel like you may not live another day. You may feel like this thing's over and you've not... It ain't over, kid. I'm going to do something with you that you ain't even have a fathom for. I'm going to take you all the way to Rome, put you at the foot of Caesar for you to argue the same thing you just argued with these heathen. You can go argue with those heathen. Why? Because I am the Son of God. I am the redeemed King. I am God. And I have empowered you and I will lead you and guide you and take you where I want you to go. And you're going to have fist fights in this world. And it's going to beat you up. And it's going to be a struggle. Because I have made you whole and made you complete and made you a new thing and set you free from the darkness of this world. And when you become the light of the world and you stand in the dark, it hurts. It ain't easy. It's not fun because you now have recognition of what it is you can be. And you can look around you and see what people are. And you're trying to convince them to be something that they're not. But take courage, I am with you. So let's not be a church that feels like God has forgotten us. He is with you in the good times. He is with you in the bad times. He is with you in the moments when you feel like you can't take one more step. He is with you in those moments when you fail, when you continue to get beat up. He is right there by your side. And when you pull back from the situation, when you go to clean up the wounds, when you go to try to restart and figure it out, He is standing with you in that jail cell going, hey, take courage. You did good and you can do better. So much so, I'll prove it to you. And if you'll follow me and if you'll come along with me, I will take you to places that you don't even think you're capable of going, but you've got to put to death this idea that you and you, ha you have in your head that you don't think you're good enough or you're not going to measure up or you can never conquer sin. That is the evil of this world. I have already done those things for you and I want you to be my hands and my feet in a world that needs to know there is hope for death. There is hope for these things we think we can't rise above. There is hope from the things we've done in our past. You are not what you were. You are what you are, which is a child of a king bought with a price. So let's be a church that takes courage. Let's be a church that speaks to our friends and family about who it is and what it is that we believe. Let's be like Paul, that no matter what we face, what we go through, even in the moments in ministry where we feel like we've fallen short and things aren't going the way we thought they were, that God is still on the throne. Christ is still interceding for us, and He still is our King, and we will follow Him. Let's be that church. Let's pray this morning. Lord, I come to you. I thank you for our time together, Lord. I pray for each and every person in this room. There are people in this room right now who are in a fist fight with the devil. But the devil don't fight fair, throwing sucker punches like a jerk. Those people who are living that life, Christ has overcome your sin. You're fighting a fight you don't need to fight because it's already been fought. Lord, we thank you that redemption is 100% and complete. We thank you that when you reconcile us, you don't reconcile us with conditions, but you unconditionally reconcile us back to what it is you intended us to be. Lord, I pray for those in this room who are hurting and broken by the face punches they've been taking. Those people in this room who are overwhelmed and feel like they can't take one more step, they can't deal with one more life issue, one more thing. Lord, I pray today that you would give them hope in the midst of that storm. Lord, they need to have their prison experience where you show up in the night and say, hey, I'm here, I'm with you. Take courage, sons. Take courage, daughters. 
Lord, we do not exist as Vintage Church just to be a country club or a place where we come and talk about religion, but we want to see a living, breathing, powerful God on full display in the lives of the believers who call this church home. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every person who's in that fight with the enemy that, Lord, you would appear to them. You would speak into their lives in a supernatural way that it would be abundantly clear, not a still small voice, Lord, that I pray you would loudly scream from the gates of heaven, you are my kid, you are my child, I am here, I love you, I have not forgotten you, and you were bought with a price. Lord, I pray for protection for each and every person in this room as we become movers and shakers in the spiritual realm, as we start to be a real light in a dark place, that, Lord, You would protect us from the barbs of this enemy that seeks to destroy us and devour us like a lion. Lord, I pray You would come in like a flood against what it is that You've called us to do. For each and every person in this room, Lord, I pray You would open up hearts and open up minds for where our Rome is. Lord, we're ready to take courage. We're ready to step out in faith. And so guide us and lead us where it is You want us to go. And then, Lord, I pray You would use us to draw those who are lost to us. Build Your church. Not by putting butts in seats. Not by making ourselves marketable. But build Your church by revealing You are a living, breathing, powerful God who works in the lives of believers. Lord, I thank You for every person in this room, and I thank You for the hope that You're going to convey this week. I thank You for what it is You're going to accomplish as we seek Your face. We know You love us. We know You have a plan. We know You haven't forgot us. And Lord, I pray You would continue to convey that to each and every one of us as we step out in faith in this dark world. It's in Your name we pray. Amen.